Welcome everybody to another amazing episode of Wellness Warriors. I'm Dr. Veronique Desonier, better known as Dr. V. And today I've got a super amazing guest, JJ Virgin. She started off as a business mentor, has become a very good friend, and I'm so honored to have her on the show. So let me tell you a little bit about JJ. She's a triple board certified nutrition expert and fitness hall of famer. She's very passionate about teaching people about proper nutrition and exercising, exercising smarter. She's a prominent TV personality. She's been on Dr. Phil for two years. She was the show's nutritionist. She's been on Dr. Oz, Rachel Ray, PBS, The Today Show, and the list goes on and on. She's a New York Times, uh, she's a four-time New York Times bestseller. She has four books, The Virgin Diet, The Virgin Diet Cookbook, JJ Virgin's Sugar Impact Diet, and JJ Virgin's Sugar Impact Diet Cookbook. Lastly, one of my favorite books of hers is Warrior Mom, Seven Secrets to Bold, Brave Resilience. And here she shares her story about being a leader in a family when there's a crisis situation, which she, went, when, which she experienced when she was fighting for her son's life. Also has a podcast with 5.5 million downloads called Reignite Wellness. So JJ, thanks so much for taking the time to be with me today. I know you're a busy woman, so thanks for sharing your time with us. Honored to be here. Okay, so your expert is diet, nutrition, and sugar. And we know with the women in my audience, sugar is the number one food that I tell them to avoid, obviously, because we know uh, cancer cells love sugar. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about a sweet tooth. You know, people <laughs> find out they are diagnosed with cancer, but they've been eating a certain way their whole life. And now they realize they have to let go of carbs and sugar. So how do they get over that sweet tooth and all those cravings? Yes. And I'm just pulled out my notepad to make sure I cover all of this stuff and make notes. Um, you know, this all came to be because I wrote The Virgin Diet and the biggest question I got asked about was sugar. Because when I first was doing The Virgin Diet, it was pull out these six foods that could be creating food intolerances. I didn't have sugar in there. What I didn't realize was that if I didn't pull sugar out, that they just start eating more of it. I'm like, oh my gosh, right? And while we know sugar is, not only is it it's a big risk factor for cancer and feeding cancer cells, it's also a risk factor for all the major diseases. Plus it just makes your everyday life crappy. So I set out to figure out, because what I got from people after the Virgin Diet is that the people who couldn't stay on that program and go through it were the people who could not deal with their sugar cravings. So I thought, huh. How do I help people break free of these sugar cravings? And so I took 700 people who were strugglers. They were the people who could not get rid of sugar. So I did not make this easy on myself. And I wanted to prove that I could help them break free of these sugar cravings like for good, because I knew as long as they were white knuckling it, that they would never be successful. And when I looked at all the other programs out there, I went, what, why isn't this working? And so I started reading all the negative reviews on Amazon, which is an amazing way to get information. And what I, what I had kind of hypothesized proved true. What was happening was people were trying to quit cold turkey. Now, this would only work if you were going into like a drug rehab center, right? And in reality, that's probably what you should do because sugar is the number one recreational drug of choice, but we're not going to do that. So we can't do it that way. And so if you've been eating sugar, and you may not even think you've been getting that much sugar, but as you just said, you know, all carbohydrates except for fiber turn into sugar. It's just a matter of whether we're mainlining them or we're making it slowly from the food we eat, which is obviously the better choice. And so what I found was a lot of people thought they weren't really eating that much sugar, but it was sneaking into all sorts of places. They were having that green drink that was really like five fruit juices with a little bit of kale, you know, right. <laughs> like, right. you know, more sugar than a soda. They were having marinara sauce that had more sugar than Oreo cookies. They were taking this raspberry vinaigrette and dumping it on their salad and turning it into a sundae. So the big challenge I see is that it's sneaking into so many places. We're trying to do our best. We don't even realize it. And it's keeping our sweet tooth lit up. So the first thing I have people do is figure out where is it sneaking in? What are all those places? Then I have you start to taper and trade. So trade some of the higher sugar impact foods for medium and low ones. 
while you're balancing your blood sugar and while you're retraining your taste buds to like savory and sour and spicy. And we can talk about some hacks for this um, for your sweet tooth. And what I found was you can actually retrain your, your sweet tooth in the, about two weeks. Oh, that quickly. Yes, that quickly. If you do it right, if you don't go cold turkey, that's the, the problem that I see people doing is they make the decision. They go, all right, sugar is bad for me. I'll just stop it cold. And if you've been teaching your body to use sugar as your primary fuel source and you just stop it, your energy is going to drop. You're going to feel rotten and you're not going to be able to make it past a day or two and you'll go running for the sugar. Right. It's like going through withdrawals. I mean, that's mm -hmm. how bad sugar is so addictive. Oh, yeah. People go through withdrawals. All right. So you mentioned the, the smoothie with the, the 10 fruits and the little bit of kale to make it green. <laughs> so let, let's talk about fruit. What, you know, what's your view on, on how much fruit is, is okay? I feel like a lot of those diet plans made fruit this free food. You know, fruit for, for and, and when they say have fruit for dessert, that's the right thinking because fruit really is much more of a dessert. So I don't tell people to have no fruit except for a certain part of my program, I take it out altogether. Um, or if someone's very insulin resistant, I take it out. But the big thing is to realize that fruit is not free food, that yes, it has sugar and it has a very specific type of sugar in it. It is, um, fructose. So you've got fructose and glucose and fruit. And the challenge with the fructose is, first of all, it feeds the worst cancers. And it also can only be metabolized by the liver. So where it looks like it might be good because it doesn't raise blood sugar, the challenge is by not raising blood sugar, it doesn't trigger satiety signals. And it also doesn't trigger insulin to do its job correctly. So it can create insulin resistance and create hypertension, but it goes to the liver where if there's not room to transform it to glucose and store it as glycogen, because there's not a lot of room in the liver, it's gonna be turned into fat. So for the most of us, fructose turns into fat and creates a lot of problems along the way. It creates more, um, Permeable, um, more permeable gut. Um, it's more aging than any other sugar. It's very sweet, so it keeps that sweet tooth lit up. Again, it feeds the worst cancers. But you know, big sources of fructose tend to be things like added sugars, high fructose corn syrup, agave syrup, the worst of all, because it's the right. high fructose, right? Mm -hmm. Apple juice concentrate that they'll put on a label. That's why we've got to know what we're looking for. It'll say, you know, no sugar added, yet they use apple juice concentrate, which is super high in fructose. So you've got to be super aware of these things and where they're sneaking in. So the difference between that, those added sugars, those concentrated sugars like fruit juice, which to me is like a soda, a fruit juice concentrate, which is just like syrup, jam, like syrup too, dry fruit like candy, is if you are going to eat fruit, you eat small amounts of it. That might be a cup of blueberries, um, one apple, and you eat it in its whole form. You don't dry it, you don't, you don't juice it, you don't condense it, right? You eat it in its whole form. So you get the fructose um, is offset by all the phytonutrients and the fiber that slows down the blood sugar response to all of this. Yeah, awesome. What about snacking? I know people, you know, there's so many different, you know, theories out there that, oh, yes, you should snack all day long, eat, you know, six, seven small meals versus intermittent fasting. So let's talk about snacking first. Yeah, it was interesting. I remember when the snacking thing happened. You probably do, too. I was um, a personal trainer in L.A. and was when everything started to go, when Susie Powder was big. Stop Dean Sandy. Everything should be fat free. We started pulling the fat out. I was working at a place called Pritikin. And the Pritikin Center was teaching you to have a 10% fat diet. Well, when you take your fat down that low, you're flipping hungry all the time. You know? right. So when you do that, guess what you have to do? You have to have breakfast, a snack, lunch, a snack, dinner. And oh my gosh, we cannot go to bed hungry. You must have a snack then too. <laughs> and they said then that it kept your blood sugar stable. The reality is what it's doing is keeping your blood sugar up. And when you teach your body to be a sugar burner, to rely on those little hits of food all the way along and those food, because you've lowered the fat and gone more vegetarian or primarily low carby hits, when, you're, when you eat that carb, your blood sugar comes up, 
your insulin comes up, so the blood sugar starts to come back down. And if your insulin's still up, you go, wow, I'm hungry. And so you have another hit of a carb, your blood sugar comes up again, your insulin's staying up there, might get pushed a little bit higher. The bottom line is your insulin's never coming back down to fasting, so you cannot access stored fat for fuel, so you're not a fat burner. You're relying on the incoming food. When you, that comes gets driven back down, your blood sugar comes back down, you're hungry again. And so it's just keeping you wanting to eat all throughout the day. And that was what we were being taught. We should graze, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it was so funny back then. I was, that was 30 years ago. I worked out four times what I work out now. Um, I was counting calories. I was eating less calories. I was working out four times more. I was 25. My body fat was 10% higher. Wow. I mean, and I would just, my weight was a daily, like a daily battle hmm. and, you know, and I didn't, and I would get hypoglycemic. I remember like just that horrible feeling like you should not maybe get that way after a couple of days if you were fasting, but not after a couple of hours of not right. eating. If you're supposedly a normal, healthy, you know, fitness expert. So kind of crazy to think about. Yeah, yeah, interesting how the your your learning curve is has really transformed. Oh my gosh, I know. You feel like can I just apologize to all you people that I said <laughs> to eat at? We were we were taking the fat grams down and that's what we we're counting, fat grams, because fat made you fat. The reality is we now know the exact opposite, opposite. of that. Yeah. And that the challenge is, you know, you really don't want to be a sugar burner uh, and you know you're a sugar burner if you can't go more than you know three to four hours before you have to eat again, where you never forget to eat. Like when someone says, oh my gosh, did I eat lunch? I forgot. Like that's, that's a fat burner, not a sugar burner. Sugar burners never forget their meal. They all have to eat every couple hours. They cannot lose weight off their waist. They hold on to that. They're like, I just can't seem to lose this belly fat. That is a clear sign of a sugar burner, not a fat burner. Whereas a fat burner goes and they missed lunch, no big deal. You know, they can eat a couple hours later. It's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. When they lose fat, if they need to, they can lose it effortlessly off their waist. Their energy stays stable throughout the day. They don't get hangry, right? <laughs> Those are, and, and so which do you want to be? <laughs> right, right, right. Now, <clears throat> there is so many different diets. There's keto, paleo, now carnivore, mm -hmm. uh, vegetarian, vegan, macrobiotics. I mean, you name it. I've, I've experimented and tried them all. Right. <laughs> so, so what is for for somebody who's dealing with um, an illness like cancer or, or diabetes or MS or something as serious as that, what what's your take on the the diet? I had a great uh, nutrition mentor early on who said the sicker you are, the farther back in your ancestry you should go in terms of how you eat. Now I also think that the sicker you are, the less the margin for error in what you're eating. I, I think that when you really look at diets, people tend to design specific diets based on their own personal lifestyle, what's going on with their health at the time, their genetics. And then a lot of diet gurus get out and go, now everyone should eat this way. I totally disagree. I think our biggest challenge out there with diets is that they all work. Your body does exactly what you tell it to do, but we're using them wrong. There should be a word for a diet that is short-term therapeutic specific intervention. And then there needs to be a word for how you eat every day, whatever your eating plan is. And so if you are struggling with something like cancer, very clear here, you know, like let's make sure you're getting in a lot of good antioxidants, plant nutrients, et cetera. Let's get a lot of fiber in, let's get your blood sugar balanced, let's get sugar basically out, you know, like what can you do there to really support the healing journey, good clean protein. But what I find with all of these, what I like to think of people to do is number one, all of this is a journey. The first thing that I think we need to do before we do anything else is add before we take away. So if the very first thing that you did was get clear on what currently you're trying to achieve, then first worked on just improving the quality, the overall quality of your food, like add more non-starchy vegetables, add more pure spring water, get your fiber intake up, 
make your fats clean, you know, do an oil check. Um, make sure anything you're eating, especially if you're eating animal proteins, organic, free range, pastured, wild. If you start there first, you get a lot of bad stuff out by actually just adding the good stuff in. Mm -hmm. And then look at which therapeutically, which diet is going to be the right diet intervention for you at this point, knowing your lifestyle, knowing what's going on with your health, right? It, knowing if you've got some genetic stuff going on, all of that, figure out that diet, go through and do that diet and see what changes, connect the dots between that diet and what's going on with your lab test, what's going on with how you feel, and then look what's working in there and take that piece and put it into your everyday eating plan. If you look at like all the diets that I've written, they're not, when someone says, oh yeah, I've been doing the virgin diet for years, I'm like, huh, it's actually a process that I take you through to figure out which foods work for you and which foods don't. It's not like, go on these, pull these foods out forever. It's pull these foods out and see how they work. Do you feel better or worse without these foods in? If you feel better, take them out. If you don't notice a difference, you know, so pretty simple stuff. And that's how the sugar impact diet was written too. It was written to help you figure out where sugar sneaking in, go through a process to get everything out, see how you feel, go back and see how you feel at which level of carbohydrates and sugar impact and design your diet that's right for you. Easy breezy, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, <clears throat> excuse me, you also mentioned on your website, which I love this, the phrase, your body isn't a bank account, it's a chemistry lab. So explain to us what you mean by that. So I didn't realize at the time I was saying it, like kind of how profound of a statement that really is, because you know I work in weight loss and weight loss is all hormonal. I just knew at the time that this was 25 years ago and I was in grad school, probably in doctoral school at the time. And we were taught that if you wanted to lose weight, what you had to do for your clients was create a 500 calorie deficit a day. You could either do that by exercising more or eating less. Hmm. And ideally you did both, but either one would work because your body's just a bank account. So you just create the 500 calorie deficit. All is good. And I'm very left brain. I love math. Love it. So I went, all right, I can chart this out. I've got a 150 pound woman. She wants to weigh 130. This is what we need to do. This is how long it'll take. And you know what, Veronique? It didn't work. <laughs> I was like, okay, wait, this doesn't work. And, you know, at first I thought, well, obviously these clients are cheating, right? Mm -hmm. I had, do they? Okay, they're cheating. And then I took a group away. I had one of my clients at this amazing place in Hope Ranch, Santa Barbara. So I got to take them away for a week and I controlled everything. I controlled their calories. I controlled their exercise. And it was crazy. The same thing happened. And I went, they're not cheating because I'm here. They can't cheat. There's nothing they can do. So what's going on? Why are some people losing weight? Some people stay the same, some people gaining. What is going on? What, and that's when I became obsessed with what I called weight loss resistance. What are the things getting in the way of you losing weight or causing you to gain weight? Because the reality is weight is just a symptom of your metabolism not working well. So whether it's weight going on or insulin, whatever these things are, we tend to get so judgmental about our self-worth relationship to weight, but what if it was just that you've got a thyroid issue or your sex hormones aren't balanced or you're insulin resistant or you've got toxicity and you're sitting here doing all this judgy stuff to yourself, right? right? You know, I'm like going, oh my gosh. So that's where at first I was like going, well, this is not a bank account thing. This is like a chemistry lab. And, you know, the more I get into it, the deeper I realize that's like it, it, absolutely true. And once you accept that and blow up that old paradigm, then you go, okay, so what isn't working in my metabolism? What there needs to get fixed? Is it, you know, is it insulin and leptin resistance or is it a gut microbiome issue? Like now we know that even insulin resistance can start in the gut microbiome. Um, Maybe it's food intolerances that are triggering inflammation. We know inflammation cre can create obesity that then creates more inflammation that creates more obesity. You know, is it something with toxicity that can lower your metabolism because your body's going to want to hold on to that toxins in your fat, not let them be released. And while it's doing that, it can mess up your thyroid. It can mess up uh, insulin sensitivity. That NHANES study showed that, that it wasn't obesity that was creating 
diabetes, that it was the toxins in the fat cells that were triggering the insulin resistance that was creating the diabetes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what's going on with your, your genetics? I mean, so all of these things play such a role. And once you start to see that, you, you know, it's, you can't unsee it. So that's where that whole chemistry lab came from. And I'm amazed because I still hear people talking about calories and it's, Hey, you can't go eat like whatever you want, but, but you know, the bigger thing we know with calories is that if you create a caloric deficit over time, what your body will do is downshift your metabolism to accommodate that caloric deficit so you stay the same. If you start to exercise more to offset that, your body over time will downshift your metabolism again to be able to handle that. So, you know, all this stuff, it doesn't mean that you can't, you know, optimize your metabolism and and have a better body composition, but you can't do it the way you've been trying to do it. And you probably already know that because you're like going, yeah, I tried that and it, it doesn't work. And I, you know, the biggest loser study showed that these people trashed their metabolism. And I remember hearing, um, what's her name, whoever that trainer gal was, I remember her saying, yelling at some participants saying, it's calories in, calories out. And I'm like, oh, shame on you, Missy. I know. You, know? you have just damaged so many people. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I remember those episodes. <laughs> All right, let's talk about stress. You know, one of the studies that I like to mention, that I often mention, is an 11-year study done on women with breast cancer. And they found that if they learn to manage their stress and they had community support, they had a 79% decreased risk of dying from any type of disease. So we can see how important managing our stress is. So how does stress affect our our health and our metabolism? Well, stress is going to make you crave sugar because Mm -hmm. when you're stressed, first of all, you know, when you're stressed, it starts to mess with your serotonin, which will mess with your melatonin. If it's messing with your serotonin, you're going to crave sugar. If it's messing with your melatonin, you're not going to sleep well. Then it starts to make your gut more permeable. So then you have more food reactions as well. So that makes you more inflamed. And then if you're more inflamed, you're going to have a higher risk of obesity. So you look at this and go, all right, every single thing that stress does, and I'm not talking about acute in the moment, long-term stress, you know, this is like, not like a car almost hit you and you went, oh, it's, this is the long-term stuff that really our bodies were never meant to handle because it didn't exist a thousand years ago. So again, long-term stress will mess up your sleep. It'll make your gut more permeable. It raises your blood sugar. It breaks down muscle. It makes you catabolic. It ages you. It shrinks your hippocampus. It shrinks your telomeres, you know? <laughs> so and pretty much every, all the things that we are trying to offset when we think about anti-aging and better metabolism, stress counteracts. Now, what's cool is that there are some simple things. When you really look at stress, you know, and having gone through one of the most stressful situations that you can go through, because like for me, it, I, I think that any mom would probably agree that they'd rather deal with some of their own health issues than deal with a health issue for their child, mm-hmm. right? Like mm-hmm. I always say, like, I can deal with anything as long as my kids are okay. And nearly losing a child and having that go on for years is probably the biggest stressful situation that could go on. But yet, it didn't take me down because the minute it happened, I went, all right, I've I've got to go into extreme self-care. The only way I'm going to be able to support my son and be able to take care of him is to take care of myself first. And the first thing I'm going to have to do, because I could feel the heartburn coming, because one of the things that starts to happen is, you know, first your stomach acid will come up and then it goes way down. So I was like, I could feel it is I started, like I upped all of the supplements to help with stress. I started doing my tapping and I called out to my community. And I said, all right, I don't need your sympathy, but I do need your support. Like, you know, bring it on. Healing thoughts, nice text, send salmon, whatever it is, like help, right? right? And I think, especially for women, you know, women, we're all going to be caretakers in our lives. We take care of our kids. We take care of our spouse. We take care of our parents. It's kind of one of those things. And in order to be an amazing caretaker, you have to take care of yourself. And I feel like for so many of us, we feel guilty doing that. 
um, you know, and we tend to put ourselves last and then we get into these situations. So, you know, if you're watching this and you have had a health wake up call, maybe it's just that it's a wake up call that, that your self care is the single most selfless act you can do, because if you do have a family, you've got to be able to be there for them. Absolutely. And when women are on a healing journey, and if they try to juggle their regular responsibilities and duties, and they put themselves last on the to-do list, they, they don't do well. You have to yeah. draw boundaries and say, this is all about me right now. So yeah. great. And hey, you know what? If we could start that before any of these things happen, perhaps they wouldn't. Yeah. Um, and not feel guilty about it. And yeah. check in with that and go, all right, you know, recognize what you're thinking and replace that thought because it is not selfish to practice self-care. In fact, it's the best, it's the best gift you can give your kids, your family for them to see you doing that because then they'll do it themselves. Yes. And that was, that was my biggest takeaway on my second healing journey is to learn to manage my stress and practice regular self-care, not just in a crisis moment, but all the time. So it's, it's dramatically changed my life for the better. So JJ, you've been amazing. So you have a free gift for us. I do. So I talked about being a sugar burner or a fat burner and I have a quiz. Are you a sugar burner or a fat burner? And you can get that at jjvirgin.com forward slash fat burner. And so that will walk you through it and help you identify. And again, you know, all of these things first start by you knowing where you're starting from and identifying and then judgment free going through and going, all right, so if this is going on, you know, what do I need to walk through to make that shift? into a fat burner. Excellent. So head to our website, jjvirgin.com forward slash fat burner for the quiz. And um, your website's amazing, all kinds of great recipes and fun stuff. So thanks so much for your time, JJ. And I uh, really well. appreciate sharing your wisdom with uh, our community. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, everybody have a great evening. And we will talk to you on the next episode of Wellness Warriors. This is Dr. V sending you a big healing heart hug. Bye for now.